Section 103 of the United States. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Totem Poles, Alaska. Photograph, page 504. Among many savage nations, there is a belief that certain groups of persons within the tribe are descended from certain animals. There is, then, the tribe of the wolf, the bear, or the turtle, for instance. The animal from which one thinks himself descended is sacred in his eyes, and he treats it with the utmost respect. He will not kill or eat it unless compelled by grievous necessity, and not then without expressing sincere sorrow at having to take the life of one of his friends. The totem is expected to return this allegiance, and even if it is a dangerous animal, it is believed to be harmless to its devoted friends, and even to aid them by every means in its power. Not only are there clan totems, but individuals have their own special totem, to which they must be faithful. In Alaska, the totem is carved upon a great post, which is often brilliantly painted. This post is then set up in front of the house or in the burial place. Sometimes a post is a genealogical record, exhibiting the totems of several generations. End of section 103. This recording is in the public domain. Section 104 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Valerie Marino. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 104. Learning Coal Mining by Joseph Husband. With a view to learning the operating end of soft coal mining, the author of this article on the dangers of the mines, ten days after graduating from Harvard, took his place in a mine as an unskilled workman. The Editor To the ear accustomed to the constant sound of a living world, the stillness of a coal mine, where the miles of cross-cuts and entries and the unyielding walls swallow up all sounds and echo, is a silence that is complete, but as one becomes accustomed to the silence through long hours of solitary work, sounds become audible that would escape an ear less trained. The trickling murmur of the gas, the spattering fall of a lump of coal, loosened by some mysterious force from a cranny in the wall, the sudden knocking and breaking of a stratum far up in the rock above, or the scurry of a rat off somewhere in the darkness, strike on the ear loud and startlingly. The eye, too, becomes trained to penetrate the darkness, but the darkness is so complete that there is a limit, the limit of the rays cast by the pit lamp. There is a curious thing that I have noticed, and as I have never heard it mentioned by any of the other men, perhaps it is an idea peculiar to myself. But on days when I entered the mine with the strong yellow sunlight and the blue sky as a last memory of the world above, I carried with me a condition of fair weather that seemed to penetrate down into the blackness of the entries and make my pit lamp burn a little more brightly. On days when we entered the mine with a gray sky above or with a cold rain beating on our faces, there was a depression of spirits that made the blackness more dense and unyielding and the lights from the lamp seem less cheerful. Sometimes the roof was bad in the rooms, and I soon learned from the older miners to enter my room each morning testing gingerly with my pit lamp for the presence of gas and reaching far up with my pick, tapping on the smooth stone roof as to test its strength. If the steel rang clean against the stone, the roof was good but if it sounded dull and drummy, it might be dangerous. Sometimes, when the roof was weak, we would call for the section boss and prop up the loosened stone, but more often, the men ran their risk. We worked so many days in safety that it seemed strange that death could come, and when it did come, it came so suddenly that there was a surprise, and the next day we began to forget. I had heard much of the dangers that the miner is exposed to, but little has been said of the risks to which the men through carelessness subject themselves. Death comes frequently to the coal miners from a blown-out shot when the blast is inserted in the drill hole. Several dummy cartridges are packed in for tamping. If these are properly made and tamped, 
the force of the explosion will tear down the coal properly, but if the man has been careless in his work, the champs will blow out like shot from a gun barrel, and igniting such gas or coal dust as may be present, kill or badly burn the shot firers. The proper tamping is wet clay, but it is impossible to convince the men of it, and nine out of ten will tamp their holes with dummies filled with coal dust, itself a dangerous explosive, scooped up from the side of the track. Again, powder kegs are sometimes opened in a manner which seems almost the act of an insane man. Rather than take the trouble to unscrew the cap in the head of the tin powder keg and pour out the powder through its natural opening, a miner will drive his pick through the head of the keg and pour the powder from the jagged square hole he has punched, and these are but two of the many voluntary dangers which little care on the part of the men themselves would obviate. A mine always seems more or less populated when the day shift is down, for during the hours of the working day, in every far corner at the head of every entry and room, there are men drilling, loading, and ever pushing forward its boundaries. At five o'clock, the long line of blackened miners which is formed at the foot of the hoisting shaft begins to leave the mine, and by six o'clock, with the exception of a few inspectors and fire bosses, the mine is deserted. The night shift began at eight, and it was as though night had suddenly been hastened forward to step from the soft evening twilight on the hoist, and in a brief second leave behind the world and the day and plunge back into the darkness of the mine. We were walking up the track from the mine bottom toward six west south, Billy Wild, Pat Davis, two track repairers, and I. As we turned the corner by the runaround, there came suddenly from far off in the thick stillness a faint tremor and a strong current of air. The shooters were at work. For a quarter of a mile we walked on, stopping every once in a while to listen to the far-off boom of the blast that came through the long tunnels, faint and distant, as though muffled by many folds of heavy cloth. We pushed open the big trapper's door just beyond where first and second right turn off from main entry, and came into the faint yellow glow of a single electric lamp that hung from the low-beamed roof. Beside the track, in a black niche cut in the wall of coal, two men were working. A safe twenty feet from them, their lighted pit lamps flared where they were hung by the hooks from one of the props. Round black cans of powder tumbled together in the back of the alcove. A pile of empty paper tubes and great spools of thick white fuse lay beside them. We sat down on the track at a safe distance from the open powder and watched them as they blew open the long white tubes and with a battered funnel poured in the coarse grains of powder until the smooth round carriage was filled, a yard or two of white fuse hanging from its end. In fifteen minutes they had finished, and one of the men gathered in his arms the pile of completed cartridges and joined us in the main entry. A few minutes later, as we neared the heading, a sudden singing boom came down strongly against the air current and bent back the flames in our pit lamps. Far off in the blackness ahead, a point of light marked the direction of the tunnel. Another appeared. Suddenly, from the thick silence, came the shrill whine of the air drills. A couple of lamps, like yellow tongues of flame, shone dimly in the head of the tunnel, and the air grew thick with a flurry of fine coal dust. Then, below the bobbing lights, appeared the bodies of two men, stripped to the waist, the black coating of dust that covered them moist with gleaming streaks of sweat. "'How many holes have you drilled?' yelled Wild, his voice drowned by the scream of the long air drill as the writhing bit tore into the coal. There was a final convulsive grind as the last inch of the six-foot drill sank home, then the sudden familiar absence of sound save for the hiss of escaping air. "'All done here.' Slowly the two men pulled the long screw blade from the black breast of the coal, the air hose writhing like a wounded snake about their ankles. The driller who had spoken wiped his sweaty face with his hands, his eyes blinking with the dust. He picked up his greasy coat from beside the track and wrapped it around his wet shoulders. "'Look out for the gas!' he shouted. "'There's a bit here, up high!' He raised his lamp slowly to the jagged roof. A quick blue flame suddenly expanded from the lamp and puffed down at him as he took away his hand. In the black end of the tunnel, six small holes, 
each an inch and a half in diameter and six feet deep, invisible in the darkness and against the blackness of the coal, marked where the blasts were to be placed. On the level floor stretching from one wall of the entry to the other, the undercut had been ground out with the chain machines by the machine men during the afternoon, and as soon as the blasts were in and the fuses lighted, the sudden wrench of these charges would tear down a solid block of coal six feet deep by the height and depth of the entry to fall crushed and broken into the sump cut ready for the loaders on the following morning. Selecting and examining each cartridge, the shooters charged the drill holes, two cartridges of black powder tamped in with a long copper head rod, then dummies of clay for wads, leaving hanging like a great white cord from each charged drill hole. A yard of the long white fuse, we turned and tramped down the tunnel and squatted on the track a safe fifty yards away. Down at the end of the tunnel we had just deserted, bobbed the tiny flames of the lights in the shooter's pit caps. There was a faint glow of sparks. Coming! they yelled out through the darkness, and we heard them running as we saw their lights grow larger. For a minute we silently waited. Then from the far end of the tunnel, muffled and booming like the breaking of a great wave in some vast cave, came a singing roar, now like the screech of metal hurled through the air, and the black end of the tunnel flamed suddenly defiant, a solid square of crimson flames like the window of a burning house, and a roar of flying air drove past us, putting out our lights and throwing us back against the rails. "'It's a windy one!' yelled Wild. "'Look out for the rib shots!' Like a final curtain in a darkened theater, a slow pall of heavy smoke sank down from the roof, and as it touched the floor, a second burst of flame tore it suddenly upward and far down the entry. The trapper's door banged noisily in the darkness. Then we crept back slowly, breathing hard in an air thick with dust and the smell of burnt black powder, to the end of the tunnel, where the whole face had been torn loose a great pile of broken coal against the end of the entry. Often bits of paper from the cartridges lighted by the blast will start a fire in the piles of coal dust left by the machine men, and before the shooters leave a room that has been blasted an examination must be made in order to prevent the possibility of fire. All night long we moved from one entry to another, blasting down in each six feet more of tunnel, which would be loaded out on the following day, and it was four in the morning before the work was finished. It was usually between four and five in the morning when we left the mine. As we stepped from the hoist and left behind us the confining darkness, the smoky air and the sense of oppression and silence of the mine below, the soft, fresh morning air in the early dawn, or sometimes the cool rain, seemed never more refreshing. One does not notice the silence of a mind so much upon leaving the noise of the outer world and entering the maze of tunnels on a day's work as when stepping off the hoist in the early morning hours when the world is almost still. The sudden sense of sound and of living things emphasizes by contrast the silence of the underworld. There is a noise of life, and the very motion of the air seems to carry sounds. A dog barking half a mile away in the sleeping town sounds loud and friendly, and there seems to be a sudden clamor that is almost bewildering. We were walking down the north entry one early morning and had just passed through the last brattice door when Joe Brass, one of the shot firers, stopped, suddenly alert and silent, and held up his hand. Sound means but little in a mind, and eyes can but rarely detect danger. Do you smell anything? he asked. We sniffed the cool air as it fanned past us through the door that we still held open. Almost imperceptible, a curious, foreign odor seemed to hang in the moving current. Wood smoke, said one of the men. We turned and walked back and closed the door behind us. The smell of the smoke defined itself as we walked forward. Through the next door it hung strong in the air and with it the oily smell of burning coal. Then a light appeared down the entry, and from its jerky motion we knew that the man was running before we heard his feet clumping over the rough ties. "'There's a fire in room twenty-six, he yelled before we could see him. The word had already reached to the bottom, and as we paused at the turning of the entry, trying to see whether to turn to the right or left, there was a sudden roar behind us, 
and the glow of a locomotive headlight. As we waited, the locomotive came rattling down the tunnel, half a dozen men crouched low on its black frame, and behind it, on a single flat car, the great steel water tank that was reserved for such emergencies. Shouting questions, we swung on behind. The motor followed the switch and turned sharply down to the right. Through the next door, the smoke became suddenly thick, a strong smell, almost as of burning oil, the heavy, pungent smell of soft coal on fire. In the dead air of the entry, it hung still and motionless, like yellow fog, and as we jumped off of the truck and ran down the entry behind the locomotive, we crouched low to keep our eyes clear, for there were still a couple of feet of clean air along the bottom of the tunnel. From ahead of us came the sound of voices, and then, through the smoke, we saw the lights of the men, like yellow tongues of flame detached from their bodies, which were hidden in the thick blanket of smoke. The coal in one of the rooms off the main entry, which the shooters had blasted earlier in the night, was on fire, and the heat and smoke were too intense to allow the men to reach it with the water. Shouting at each other in the blinding smoke and darkness, with the dull, steady heat of the invisible fire bringing the sweat in streams from our bodies. We worked to cut off the room from the rest of the mine by building across its broad mouth where it joined the main entry. A solid stopping of wood and plaster, a dozen men in minute relays held a long strip of canvas against the roof, while the rest of us pushed and wedged into place between the floor and the low roof a string of props or posts across the room mouth, as the smoke thickened and the heat grew more intense, the relays became shorter, and we suddenly dived from the dense, choking air above to lie flat along the floor, sucking in the cool, clean air that lay above the water beside the tracks. In half an hour, we had erected a long line of posts, with the canvas nailed against it, and a temporary stopping was effected. By that time, a dozen of the timbermen had arrived and motors had dragged up from the mine bottom piles of matched boards and sacks of wood fiber plaster. An hour more, and the stopping was reinforced, with a solid fence of boards. And then, mixing the plaster in the water beside the track, and using our hands as trowels, we caulked the seams, the plaster drying quickly against the hot boards. Three hours later, the work was done and the air current moving steadily down the entry had blown away the last shreds of the thick and choking smoke. In the light of our lamps and lanterns, we again examined the long white wall that we had erected across the room mouth, a few more handfuls of plaster on cracks through which a thin trickle of smoke still puffed outward, and the work was done. Two months later, when the fire, cut off from the air of the mine, had smothered itself to extinction, the wall was torn down, the gas blown out, and work once more resumed. End of section 104. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Valerie Marino. Section 105 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Nater. The World Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 105. The Social Value of the Telephone in the United States. By Herbert N. Casson. What we might call the telephonization of city life, for lack of a simpler word, has remarkably altered our manner of living from what it was in the days of Abraham Lincoln. It has enabled us to be more social and cooperative. It has literally abolished the isolation of the separate family. It has become so truly an organ of the social body that we now enter into contracts by telephone, give evidence, try lawsuits, make speeches, propose marriage, confer degrees, appeal to voters, and do almost everything else that is a matter of speech. In stores and hotels this wire traffic has grown to an almost bewildering extent. The 100 largest hotels in New York City have 21,000 telephones, nearly as many as the continent of Africa, and more than the Kingdom of Spain. In an average year, they send 6 billion messages. The Waldorf Astoria alone tops all residential buildings with 1,120 telephones and 500,000 calls a year, while merely the Christmas Eve orders that flash into Marshall Field's store or John Wanamaker's have risen as high as 3,000. 
Whether the telephone concentrates population or scatters it is a question that has not yet been examined. It is certainly true that it has made the skyscraper possible, and thus helped to create an absolutely new type of city that was never imagined even in the fairy tales of ancient nations. The skyscraper is ten years younger than the telephone. It is now generally admitted to be the ideal building for business offices. It is one of the few types of architecture that may fairly be called American, and its efficiency is largely, if not mainly, due to the fact that its inhabitants may run errands by telephone as well as by elevator. There seems to be no activity which is not being made more convenient by the telephone. It is used to call the duck shooters in western Canada when a flock of birds has arrived, and to direct the movements of the dragon in Wagner's grand opera Siegfried. At the last Yale-Harvard football game, it conveyed the almost instantaneous news to 50,000 people in various parts of New England. At the Vanderbilt Cup race, its wires girdled the track and reported every gain or mishap of the racing autos. And at such extensive pageants as that of the Quebec Centenary in 1908, where 4,000 actors came and went upon a 10-acre stage, every order was given by a telephone. Public officials, even in the United States, have been slow to change from the old-fashioned and more dignified use of written documents and uniformed messengers. But in the last ten years there has been a sweeping revolution in this respect, government by telephone. This is the new idea that has already arrived in the more efficient departments of the Federal Service. And as for the present Congress, that body has gone so far as to plan for a special system of its own in both houses, so that all official announcements may be heard by wire. Gerfield was the first among American presidents to possess a telephone. An exhibition instrument was placed in his house without cost in 1878, while he was still a member of Congress. Neither Cleveland nor Harrison, for temperamental reasons, used the magic wire very often. In their time, there was one lonely idle telephone in the White House, used by the servants several times a week. But with McKinley came a new order of things. To him a telephone was more than a necessity. It was a pastime, an exhilarating sport. He was the one president who really reveled in the comforts of telephony. In 1895 he had sat in his Canton home and heard the cheers of the Chicago Convention. Later he sat there and ran the first presidential telephone campaign, talked to his managers in 38 states. Thus he came to regard the telephone with a higher degree of appreciation than any of his predecessors, and eulogized it on many public occasions. It is bringing us all closer together, was his favorite phrase. To Roosevelt the telephone was mainly for emergencies. He used it to the full during the Chicago Convention of 1907 and the Peace Conference at Portsmouth. But with Taft the telephone became again the common avenue of conversation. He introduced at least one new telephonic custom, a long-distance talk with his family every evening when he is away from home. Instead of the solitary telephone of Cleveland Harrison days, the White House has now a branch exchange of its own, Main 6, with a sheaf of wires that branch out into every room as well as to the nearest central. Next to public officials, bankers were perhaps the last to accept the facilities of the telephone. They were slow to abandon the old fallacy that no business can be done without a written record. James Stillman, of New York, was first among bankers to foresee the telephone era. As early as 1875, while Bell was teaching his infant telephone to talk, Stillman risked $2,000 in a scheme to establish a crude dial system of wire communication, which later grew into New York's first telephone exchange. At the present time, the banker who works closest to his telephone is probably George W. Perkins of the J.P. Morgan group of bankers. He is the only man, says Morgan, who can raise 20 millions in 20 minutes. The Perkins plan of rapid transit telephony is to prepare a list of names from 10 to 30 and to flash from one to another as fast as the operator can ring them up. Recently, one of the other members of the Morgan Bank proposed to enlarge its telephone equipment. What will we gain by more wires? asked the operator. If we were to put in a 600 pair cable, Mr. Perkins would keep it busy. The most brilliant feat of the telephony in the financial world was done during the panic of 1907. 
At the height of the storm, on a Saturday evening, the New York bankers met in almost desperate conference. They decided, as an emergency measure of self-protection, not to ship to Western banks. At midnight they telephoned this decision to the bankers of Chicago and St. Louis. These men, in turn, conferred by telephone, and on Sunday afternoon called up the bankers of neighboring states. And so the news went from phone to phone, until by Monday morning all bankers and chief depositors were aware of the situation and prepared for the team play that prevented any general disaster. As for stockbrokers of the Wall Street species, they transact practically all of their business by telephone. In their stock exchange stand 641 booths, each one the terminus of a private wire. A firm of brokers will count it an ordinary year's talking to send 50,000 messages, and there is one firm which last year sent twice as many. Of all brokers, the one who finally accomplished most by telephony was unquestionably E. H. Harriman. In the mansion that he built at Arden, there were a hundred telephones, with sixty of them linked to the long-distance lines. What the brush is to the artist, what the chisel is to the sculptor, the telephone was to Harriman. He built his fortune with it. It was in his library, his bathroom, his private car, his camp in the Oregon wilderness. No transaction was too large or too involved to be settled over its wires. He saved the credit of the Erie by telephone lent it five million dollars as he lay at home on a sick bed he is a slave to the telephone wrote a magazine editor nonsense replied harriman it is a slave to me the telephone arrived in time to prevent big corporations from being unwieldy and aristocratic the foreman of a pittsburgh coal company may now stand in his subterranean office and talk to the president of the steel trust who sits on the twenty-first floor of a new york skyscraper the long-distance talks especially have grown to be indispensable to the corporations whose plants are scattered and geographically misplaced to the mills of new england for instance that use the cotton of the south and sell so much of their product to the middle west to the companies that sell perishable commodities an instantaneous conversation with a buyer in a distant city has often saved a carload or a cargo such caterers as the meat packers who were among the first to realize what bell had made possible have greatly accelerated the wheels of their business by intercity conversations for ten years or longer the kudahis have talked every business morning between omaha and boston by a one thousand five hundred and seventy miles of wire in the refining of oil the standard oil company alone at its new york office sends two hundred and thirty thousand messages a year in the making of steel a chemical analysis is made of each cauldron of molten pig iron when it starts on its way to be refined and this analysis is sent by telephone to the steel maker so that he will know exactly how each potful is to be handled in the floating of logs down river instead of having relays of shouters to prevent the logs from jamming there is now a wire along the bank with a telephone linked on at every point of danger in the rearing of skyscrapers it is now usual to have a temporary wire strung vertically so that the architect may stand on the ground and confer with a foreman who sits astride of a naked girder three hundred feet up in the air the first steamship line to use the telephone was the clyde which had a wire from their dock to the office in eighteen seventy seven and the first railway was the pennsylvania which two years later was persuaded by professor bell himself to give it a trial in altoona since then this railroad has become the chief beneficiary of the art of telephony it has one hundred and seventy five exchanges four hundred operators thirteen thousand telephones and twenty thousand miles of wire a more ample system than the city of new york had in eighteen ninety six in the operation of trains the railroads have waited thirty years before they dared to trust the telephone just as they waited fifteen years before they dared to trust the telegraph in eighteen eighty three a few railways used the telephone in a small way but in nineteen o seven when a law was passed that made telegraphers highly expensive there was a general swing to the telephone several dozen roads have now put it in use some employing it as an associate of the morse method and others as a complete substitute it has always been found to be the quickest way of dispatching trains it will do in five minutes what the telegraph did in ten and it has enabled railroads to hire more suitable men for the smaller offices
In news gathering, too, much more than in railroading, the day of the telephone has arrived. The _Boston Globe_ was the first paper to receive news by telephone. Later came the _Washington Star_, which had a wire strung to the capital, and thereby gained an hour over its competitors. To day the evening papers receive most of their news over the wire. This has resulted in a specialization of reporters. One man runs for the news and another man writes it. Some of the runners never come to the office. They receive their assignments by telephone and their salary by mail. There are even a few who are allowed to telephone their news directly to a swift Lanotype operator who clicks it into type on his machine without the scratch of pencil. This, of course, is the ideal method of news gathering, which is rarely possible. A paper of the first class, such as the New York World, had now an outfit of twenty trunk lines and eighty telephones. Its outgoing calls are 200,000 a year, and its incoming calls 300,000, which means that for every morning, evening, and Sunday edition, there has been an average of 750 messages. The ordinary newspaper in a small town cannot afford such a service, but recently the United Press has originated a cooperative method. It telephones the news over one wire to 10 or 12 papers at the same time. In ten minutes, a thousand words can in this way be flung out to a dozen towns as quickly as by telegraph and much more cheaply. But it is in a dangerous crisis when safety seems to hang upon a second that the telephone is at its best. It is the instrument of emergencies, a sort of ubiquitous watchman. When a girl operator in the exchange hears a cry for help, quick, the hospital, the fire department, the police, she seldom waits to hear the number. She knows it. She is trained to save half seconds, and it is at such moments, if ever, that the users of a telephone can appreciate its insurance value. No doubt, if a King Richard III were worsted on a modern battlefield, his instinctive cry would be, My kingdom for a telephone! When instant action is needed in the city of New York, a general alarm can in five minutes be sent by the police wire over its whole vast area of 300 square miles. When, recently, a gas main broke in Brooklyn, sixty girls were at once called to the centrals in that part of the city to warn the ten thousand families who had been placed in danger. When the ill-fated General Slocum caught fire, a mechanic in a factory on the waterfront saw the blaze and had the presence of mind to telephone the newspapers, the hospitals, and the police. When a small child is lost, or a convict has escaped from prison, or the forest is on fire, or some menace from the weather is at hand, the telephone gives the news. In one tragic case, the operator in Folsom, New Mexico, refused to quit her post until she had warned her people of a flood that had broken loose in the hills above the village. Because of her courage, nearly all were saved, though she herself was drowned at the switchboard. If the disaster cannot be prevented, it is the telephone, usually, that brings first aid to the injured. After the destruction of San Francisco, Governor Guild of Massachusetts sent an appeal for the stricken city to the 354 mayors of his state, and by the courtesy of the Bell Company, which carried the messages free, they were delivered to the last and furthermost mayors in less than five hours. After the destruction of Messina, an order for enough lumber to build 10,000 houses was cabled to New York and telephoned to Western lumbermen. So quickly was this order filled that on the twelfth day after the arrival of the cablegram, the ships were on their way to Messina with the lumber. After the Kansas City flood of 1903, when the drenched city was without railways or streetcars or electric cars, it was the telephone that held the city together and brought help to the dangerous spots. And after the Baltimore fire, the telephone exchange was the last to quit and the first to recover. Its girls sat on their stools at the switchboard until the window panes were broken by the heat. Then they pulled the covers over the board and walked out. Two hours later, the building was in ashes. Three hours later, another building was rented on the unburdened rim of the city, and the wire chiefs were at work. In one day, there was a system of wires for the use of the city officials. In two days, these were linked to the long-distance wires, and in eleven days, a 2,000-line switchboard was in full working trim. This feat still stands as the record in rebuilding. In the supreme emergency of war, the telephone is as indispensable, very nearly, as the cannon. 
This, at least, is the belief of the Japanese, who handled their armies by telephone when they drove back the Russians. Each body of Japanese troops moved forward like a silkworm, leaving behind it a glistening strand of red copper wire. At the decisive battle of Mugden, the silkworm army, with a million legs, crept against the Russian hosts in a vast crescent a hundred miles from end to end. By means of this glistening red wire, the various batteries and regiments were organized into fifteen divisions. Each group of three divisions was wired to a general, and the five generals were wired to the great Oyama himself, who sat ten miles back of the firing line and sent his orders. Whenever a regiment lunged forward, one of the soldiers carried a telephone set. If they held their position, two other soldiers ran up with a spool of wire. In this way, and under fire of the Russian cannon, 150 miles of wire were strung across the battlefield. As the Japanese said, it was this quote-unquote flying telephone that enabled Oyama to manipulate his forces as handily as though he were playing a game of chess. It was in this war, too, that the Mikado's soldiers strung the costliest of all telephone wires at 203-meter hill. When the wire had been basted up this hill to the summit, the fortress of Port Arthur lay at their mercy. But the climb had cost them 24,000 lives. Of the 7 million telephones in the United States, about 2 million are in farmhouses. Every fourth American farmer is in telephonic touch with his neighbors and the market. Iowa leads among the farming states. Not to have a telephone in Iowa is to belong to what a Londoner would call the quote-unquote submerged tenth of the population. Second in line comes Illinois, with Kansas, Nebraska, and Indiana following closely behind. And at the foot of the list, in the matter of farm telephones, are Connecticut and Louisiana. The first farmer who discovered the value of the telephone was the market gardener. Next came the Bonanza farmer of the Red River Valley. Such a man, for instance, as Olive Dalrymple of North Dakota, who found that by the aid of the telephone he could plant and harvest 30,000 acres of wheat in a single season. Then, not more than a half a dozen years ago, there arose a veritable telephone crusade among the farmers of the Middle West. Cheap telephones that were fairly good had by this time been made possible by the improvements of the Bell engineers, and stories of what could be done by telephone became the favorite gossip of the day. One farmer had kept his barn from being burned down by telephoning for his neighbors. Another had cleared $600 of extra profit on the sale of his cattle by telephoning to the best market. A third had rescued a flock of sheep by sending quick news of an approaching blizzard. A fourth had saved his son's life by getting an instantaneous message to the doctor, and so on. How the telephone saved a $3 million fruit crop in Colorado in 1909 is the story that is oftenest told in the West. Until that year, the frosts in the spring nipped the buds. No farmer could be sure of the harvest. But in 1909, the fruit growers bought smudge pots, 300,000 or more. These were placed in the orchards, ready to be lit at a moment's notice. Next, an alliance was made with the United States Weather Bureau, so that whenever the Frost King came down from the north, a warning could be telephoned to the farmers. Just when Colorado was pink with apple blossoms, the first warning came, Get ready to light up your smudge pots in half an hour. Then the farmers telephoned to the nearest towns, Frost is coming, come and help us in the orchards. Hundreds of men rushed out into the country on horseback and in wagons. In half an hour, the last warning came, Light up, the thermometer registers 29. The smudge pot artillery was set ablaze and kept blazing until the news came that the icy forces had retreated. And in this way, every Colorado farmer who had a telephone saved his fruit. End of section 105「Section 106 of the United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2020. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 106. 
How the Panama Railroad was built, 1849 to 1855, by Hugh C. Weir. The Panama Railroad was commenced in 1849, and in 1855 the first train passed over its rails. Its probable cost was estimated at $5 million, but the necessity of bringing all things needed from the United States, and the increase in the price of labor resulting from the discovery of gold in California, brought the amount up to $7.5 million. The following article gives some idea of the difficulties and dangers which had to be met. The Editor the section boss thrust his head beyond his tent flap and instantly drew back with a hoarse gasp of terror. Half-dressed and half-stunned, he took a cautious step outside the door, and then another, and another, until he came into full view of the half-moon of twisted, bloated horrors swung on the palm-trees before him. One hundred and twenty-five coolies from the Chinese camp were suspended by their queues from the swaying branches. Driven mad by the gloom of the jungle, they had sought wholesale suicide in the night. For years the section boss had rubbed elbows with death. He had come to look upon grim things with a grin. But as he digested the scene before him, his knees gave way and he toppled forward in a sprawling faint. The incident was but one link in the chain of the horrors of the Panama Railroad. Those were red years for the construction gang of the first line of rails to span the American continent. On a roadbed of blood the ties were laid which were to mark an industrial epoch. If it was the narrowest point of the continent, it was also the wildest. Forty-seven miles linked the Atlantic and the Pacific at this land ribbon of the Caribbean, but they were forty-seven miles of tragedies. With the exception of a wandering adventurer, the engineers were the first white men to force a way through the jungle since the daredevil days of the Spanish main. And it was the devil's own cauldron, in very truth, into which they plunged. There are those who say the road cost the life for every tie. Exaggerated? Possibly. But grim facts show that more than six thousand men went to their deaths in the tangled underbrush before the last rail was laid. Every mile of progress cost over one hundred and twenty-seven lives. The history of these forty-seven miles of track is one of the most tingling, red-blooded chapters in all the records of American railroad building. It is more. It is a monument to the undaunted, unrivaled heroism of American engineers, which no section of the globe can surpass. It is something over half a century ago, to be exact in the autumn of 1849, that the first construction gang, bunking at night on board a cramped sailing vessel in the Colon Harbor, plunged into the red mud of the Panama swamps waist deep in the slimy depths forced to chop every foot of the way through the heavy interlacing foliage the men entered resolutely into the task which was to stretch over a period of more than six years in the first year over one hundred died from snake bites alone the victims of the tarantula and the scorpion numbered as many more buzzing swarms of mosquitoes from the pestilent pools and streams inland settled like a heavy grey cloud over their shoulders, bringing typhoid, malaria, yellow fever. Men died by scores and hundreds, and their comrades, with the sickly yellow of disease stamping their brows, gave them a hasty grave and a hastier prayer, and plunged again into the conquest of the wilderness. Nature conspired to make the picture yet blacker. Sudden stretches of quicksands were found, whose boundaries were marked by the despairing shrieks of stumbling victims. The swamp grew thicker and blacker and marshier. Engineering statistics report that often bottom was not found at a distance of 180 feet. Thousands of cords of wood and stone were dumped into the mysterious morasses in a desperate effort to construct causeways for the roadbed. Even to this day, in the gloomy shadows of the Black Swamp, a scant five miles from the Atlantic terminal of Colon, the slimy earth sinks into a yawning cavern, and rails, ties, and men drop forever from sight. 
Once a freight car was dumped into the hungry morass in an effort to make a solid surface. Within six hours the car had disappeared from view, and the black slime seemed to clamor for more. It was at Bas Obispo that the wholesale suicide pact of the coolies climaxed the terrors of the road builders. In the early fifties, a consignment of one thousand Chinese had been imported to recruit the shattered ranks of laborers. For six depressing weeks, the coolies struggled under the lash of the jungle. When the swaying burden of the palm trees, in the soft light of the early morning, showed the ghastly fate their companions had sought, it was as a spark of gunpowder. The Americans endeavored in vain to check the mill race of the panic. Before the day was over, three hundred more had been added to the suicide roll. Scores rushed to the shores of the Atlantic, and squatting stoically in the sands, waited for the white crest of the tide to sweep them away. It was from Reynolds, civil engineer, and Brewster, mining prospector, that I heard the story as we sipped English cola on the veranda of the Cristobal YMCA building just above the Blue Atlantic. Reynolds nodded to the group of railroad men who lounged out of the reading room as he rose to the feet. Yes, it is a black-bordered story, he said slowly. The history of the Panama Railroad isn't made up of ice cream adjectives. But the men who gave their lives for it didn't die in vain, added Brewster gravely, and we all stared out at the grey line of the surf in silence. Afterwards I verified the date I had in mind. It was on the 27th day of January, 1855, that the first locomotive crossed the American continent from ocean to ocean, by way of the Panama Railroad. Coupled with the heroism of the builders, the greed of the promoters has been the outstanding quality in the history of the Panama Railroad. In the course of fifty years it is estimated that the line, less than fifty miles in length, has made a net profit of more than seventy-five million dollars. In proportion to its size it has probably produced the greatest earnings of any railroad in the history of the world. It was in 1848, at the beginning of the California gold craze, that William Henry Aspinwall, John Lloyd Stevens, and Henry Chauncey of New York incorporated the Panama Railroad Company. From the outset, the most amazing hold-up schemes in railroad history were instituted. The original cost of the line amounted, roughly, to $8 million. Often the profits totaled $2 million annually. For years a passenger rate of 16 cents a mile was demanded. Realizing how thoroughly the line dominated the transcontinental shipping situation, the company announced the most colossal freight rate ever known. A toll was established, amounting to 50% of the transportation charge for the entire distance between New York and Valparaiso, 4,630 miles. In other words, the shipping expense for the 47 miles of the land route was as great as the charge for the 4,583 miles of the water route. Enormous quantities of coffee from the Central and South American plantations were shipped to European markets via the Panama Railroad. The total transportation charge was $30 a ton. Of this amount, the railroad company coolly demanded one half, $15 for 47 miles. The shipper was helpless. The railroad could carry his goods from ocean to ocean in five hours. On the other hand, if he followed the water route and sent his products down around Cape Horn, often five months were required to make the same distance. In the fall of 1879, when the Lesseps undertook the construction of the Panama Canal for the French, the railroad was offered to him for $14 million, a rate of $200 a share. The Lesseps haughtily informed the company that it was a hold-up price. Very well was the calm rejoinder. The price will advance $25 a share every six months. Nelesips shrugged his shoulders and went to work. The railroad officials grinned and also went to work. The shipments of the French supplies began to be delayed. 
Machinery which reached Cologne in September did not arrive at Culebra 15 miles away until October. Cars, filled with French goods, were mysteriously sidetracked and allowed to stand for days in the jungle. Gradually, the Lesseps realized that the railroad had the upper hand. How much for the stock now? he asked in desperation. It is twelve months since our first offer, was the reply. You will have to pay two hundred fifty dollars. And the Lesseps paid it. Instead of fourteen million dollars, the road cost the French seventeen point five million dollars. For twelve years, the Panama Railroad remained under French ownership. It was in 1902 when France shook herself free forever from the shadow of the Lesseps' historic failure in the Panama jungles that the American government secured the railroad, together with the entire canal property and equipment, for $40 million, less than half of the value placed upon it by a conservative receiver. Although both the Panama Railroad and Panama Canal are government institutions, a broad line separates the two. The former handles the dirt trains of the canal entirely in the relation of a lessee. Nearly three million cubic yards of dirt are excavated by the canal diggers every 30 days. Were it not for the Panama Railroad, the question of its disposal would make the task of the Isthmian Canal Commission an impossibility. End of section 106「Section 107 of the United States」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2020. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 107 The Steam Shovel at Panama by Hugh C. Weir. The idea of cutting the isthmus of Panama by a canal is an old one, discussed as early as 1528. As time passed, it was brought forward by numerous persons, and many surveys were made. In 1878, a French company attempted to cut through the isthmus, spent a large amount of money, and failed. A second attempt was also given up for lack of money. At length, the United States determined to undertake the work. Colombia refused to assent to a proposed treaty for the construction of the canal, and thereupon the province of Panama promptly seceded, and the United States, with equal promptness, recognized the new republic. A treaty was made at once, granting the right to make the canal. The French company was paid $40 million for its property, and the canal was dug. The sanitary conditions of the isthmus had been one of the worst obstacles which the French had had to encounter, but the United States paved the streets, drained the swamps, installed waterworks and built sewers, and was so successful in its attempts to shut out yellow fever, malaria, and kindred diseases that Panama may almost be looked upon as a health resort. The Editor All in, called Peterson curtly over his shoulder. Bending forward, he switched the starting gear into place. The car darted swiftly down the rails, and we were off. We swung past the Culebra station, every moment adding to our speed. The morning air was whipping our faces with a pleasant, invigorating thrill, and the spirit of the swift dash was beginning to take firm hold of us. Peterson slackened his pace as we neared the switch beyond, and hurriedly crossed his hands out over the side of the car, the silent signal to the workmen ahead that he wished to change into the adjoining line. On his side, Jim was duplicating the caution, which was soon to grow familiar to us. It was at White House, a small dot of a station between Culebra and the neighboring point of Empire, that we again swerved our course, and Peterson cried, We are entering the big cut now. Keep your eyes open, Jim. The need of the warning was soon apparent. 
within the space of the next eight miles over one hundred locomotives were backing and switching often barely grazing each other as they darted to and fro in the swirling mist of their own steam a collision might come at any moment even with the experienced hand of peterson guiding us attached to scores of the engines were long rows of dirt cars partially filled every moment adding to their great loads of clay and rocks there are more men killed on the panama railroad dodging dirt trains than from any other cause peterson grimly informed us which was pleasant intelligence as we darted down past the bumping rows of swaying cars and they darted down past us the motor and the trains really playing an exciting game of hide and seek or prisoner's base the towering walls of culebra cut were now rising above us their great rugged faces seeming to scowl in baffled rage at the army of sweating men below who day by day were ploughing deeper and farther into their sides for centuries these great swollen mountains had defied the assaults of men laughing at their efforts to bore a passage through their rocky ridges and now the men in their turn were laughing at the efforts of the bullying mountains to check their advance have you ever studied the picture of a noted battlefield do you recall the thick clouds of smoke the spurting cannon the stacks of rifles the heaps of dead and wounded men change the field of battle to culebra cut you will see the same thick black clouds of smoke instead of the belching cannon you will find a hundred times more deadly instrument in the giant dynamite blasts the monster steam shovels the great levelers and air drillers are the weapons of warfare and the opposing forces are the armies of men and nature it is not one battle but a series of deadly battles and they are all to the death hundreds of men thousands of men are before and behind and around us black men white men yellow men red men men with their coats and shirts and collars off with grimy hands and perspiring faces and straining shoulders men to whom a dozen different languages might be addressed without finding their native tongues over all tower the great scowling cliffs before you is the constant swirl of brown smoke and on every side the screech of shrill locomotive whistles the hoarse shouts of toiling men the grinding crunch of the steam shovels peterson turned suddenly as we worked our way in between the overhanging cliff walls our speed was but little more than a bare zigzagging crawl and cried crisply we're coming to one of the largest steam shovels on the isthmus do you want to stop in answer to my nod the motor paused and i sprang out on to the ground at close quarters with my first steam shovel if you can imagine pounds magnified to tons and can conceive of a monster iron scoop that can handle these tons as easily as you can handle an ordinary baseball if you can picture such a gigantic machine so cleverly constructed that it is possible for one man to swing the great dipper where and when he pleases you will have a dim framework of the american steam shovel as it is operating at the big ditch can you go a step farther and imagine the man placed in such a position that he is hidden from view the monster scoop seeming to work of its own accord a great rough creature of iron and steel suddenly giving the power of life if you can you will have an even better idea of what the steam shovel really is i clambered across onto the half-filled dirt train beside the motor that i might get a closer view as i did so the iron dipper struck a mammoth boulder half buried in the red clay below deeper and deeper its four iron teeth worked their way into the sticky mud at the base of the great stone the boulder suddenly leaned over under the weight of the scoop 
and then, as I gasped, it was lifted bodily from the ground, wedged tightly between the gaping iron jaws. The shovel gave a terrific upward jerk, and almost before I realized it, the huge stone was being suspended in the air above my head. Jump! shouted Peterson from the motor. Great Scott, man, that boulder weighs twenty tons! I didn't wait for additional explanation. With the most rapid step I think I have ever made, I sprang to the ground, and none too soon. The next moment the flap of the dipper opened, and the boulder dropped into the flat car with a dull thud. But it didn't stay. Hardly had it settled on the clay when it turned on its side, rolling ponderously toward the ground. The steam shovel wasn't idle, however. With a slow, awkward movement it again swung around, its iron edge striking the rock with a force that caromed it sharply over in the other direction. And then, as though the boulder was suddenly fired with electric energy, it plunged off toward the opposite end of the car, every instant gathering new force. Again the steam shovel worked around, and this time, with a resounding jar, dealt the giant slab of granite another blow. The boulder's course was abruptly checked, but only momentarily. A third time it commenced to roll, plugging toward the ground with even greater velocity than before. It was a thrilling crisis for the layman. With a jerk as though it had gathered all of its energies for a final spurt, the great shovel pivoted about hesitated as if measuring the most effective spot at which to strike and literally grappled with its granite opponent the boulder's massive strength drew a ringing crash from the iron dipper but it had brought up against an obstacle it could not move it was vanquished slowly the steam shovel withdrew hovering in the neighborhood a moment ready for another attack but the stone was firmly lodged this time. The dipper had done its work well. "'How many miles of track would you guess have been laid on the isthmus?' queried Peterson as our car threaded its way beyond a more than usually active row of dirt trains. "'Possibly a hundred, I suggested. He laughed as he shook his head. "'You will have to multiply that number by four, and then add some.' he rejoined. There are 448 miles of rails in Panama, in a distance of just 47 miles. In other words, we often have 12 and 15 tracks in a row. There are fully this many before us now. During a lull in the activity around me, I glanced at the cliff above. Its scarred, jagged surface showed nearly every color of the rainbow. Here was a surface of gray, there a bright scarlet hue, yonder a line of tan, to the left a dark slate color, below a flaming yellow, the blending outlines of the different strata of dirt uncovered in the ever-deepening excavations. There is the famous gold hill to our left, explained Peterson. Gold hill? I repeated. The point from which Balboa discovered the Pacific, the chauffeur added. The ocean is twelve miles from here, he continued. You can see it easily on a clear day, but I wouldn't care to have had Balboa's trip to reach it, eh? I wondered curiously what the explorer's feelings would have been could he have pictured the present scene in Culebra Cut. Assuredly he would have termed the steam shovel a fabled giant lurking in the Panama wilderness like the dragons of old. It was easy to see now that we were approaching the end of the great cut. The cliffs had broken off sharply, and the number of workmen had abruptly lessened. Peterson brought the car to a sudden halt, the turntable was again brought into play, and we were switched off at right angles to begin our circling way back to Culebra through the dark undergrowth of the jungle. End of section 107
Section 108 of The United States. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2020. The World's Story, Volume 13, The United States. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 108. The Triumph of the Wireless. 1909, by Captain J. B. Ranson, Royal Naval Reserve. On the morning of the disaster, we had already made the Nantucket lightship by the submarine bell. The Baltic was inward bound for New York from Liverpool, and we were going at a reduced speed in a very heavy fog. We had located the lightship about midnight, and had proceeded about eighty miles to the westward. At 7.15 on that Saturday morning, the wireless operator came rushing up to me on the bridge. He did not take time to write the message on the usual printed form, but had put it down on the first slip of paper he could lay his hands on, and handed me this message. The Republic Dangerously. Latitude 40.17 North. Longitude 70 West. You can see from the wording of the message, from which some such word as injured is apparently omitted after the word dangerously, in what urgent haste it was sent. It came from the wireless station at Siasconset on the island of Nantucket. My first move was to throw the helm hard a starboard and make for the position of the Republic with all possible speed. We knew her latitude and longitude, and our job was to find her in the thickest kind of a fog. At that time we were sixty-four miles from the position given us in the first message from the Republic, but of course she was drifting all the time, and during our twelve-hour search I estimate we travelled two hundred miles in our zigzag course before we found her, and all within a sea area of ten square miles. But before I go on with the story, I might explain the three scientific methods which we employed in our hunt for the drifting republic. These were wireless telegraphy, the submarine bell and telephone system, and Sir William Thompson's apparatus for sounding. Wireless telegraphy you are doubtless familiar with. Almost all passenger vessels, as well as naval ships, are supplied with it and can communicate with each other or with the stations on land within a radius of two hundred miles. A wireless message cannot convey to you the definite position of a moving vessel. The electric waves from a wireless instrument move in a circle. It is like throwing a stone into the water, and the stronger you throw the stone, the farther the wavelets go. So, if you get a distress call, the vessel sending it may be anywhere in any direction within a circle of 200 miles, of which the sending vessel is the center. Of course, a vessel in trouble can send her latitude and longitude, and that helps to locate her. But if you are in a fog and have lost your reckoning, wireless will not help you much in regard to the position of the land. But a submarine bell will. The Nantucket lightship, like all modern lightships in this country, Great Britain and the continent of Europe, has a submarine bell which is kept constantly ringing, by compressed air, I believe. The sound waves go out below the surface of the water and can be heard for a distance of 17 miles by passing ships with the proper instruments installed. On my ship, for example, there are two apertures on either side of the bow which you might call submarine ears. They are connected by wires with a telephone receiver on the bridge. By listening at this telephone and switching the instrument from the starboard ear to the port ear and back again, you can hear the faint tones of the lightship's submarine bell when you get in range of it. If the tone is louder through the starboard ear than through the port ear, you know the lightship is on your starboard side. If the tone is exactly the same through both ears, you know the lightship is dead ahead. This apparatus helped me greatly, as I shall explain later, in finding the Republic. 
The third method I employed, in connection with the wireless telegraph and submarine bell, was Sir William Thompson's sounding apparatus. The Baltic was equipped with this appliance, and we could take soundings to the depth of 100 fathoms while going at full speed. Employing the ordinary method of a sounding lead attached to a rope, you have to stop your ship dead to take a sounding. The modern sounding appliance is attached to a wire like a piano string, and it goes to the bottom, records the depth, and is hoisted to the deck again, without the ship's speed being retarded a second. Moreover, the weight at the end of the wire is filled with a substance, often just common brown soap, to which some of the soil or sand or mud of the bottom of the sea sticks. An examination of this material, which is frequently described on the charts or is known from previous experience, helps to locate your position. This explanation will enable you to understand a little better, perhaps, how we pursued the Republic all day long, like a hound on the scent, and finally found her, at about half past six in the evening, after steering and zigzagging about all day. The Republic's position, as I have already said, kept constantly changing in the fog, and as fast as I could get to a point of latitude and longitude noted in the last wireless message received, Captain Sealby on the Republic would have moved, involuntarily, of course, to another. I was getting wireless messages thick and fast all the time, from Captain Sealby on the Republic, from the company's office in New York via Sias Consett, and from the other ships which had joined in the search for the Republic in response to the CQD distress call, of which we have heard so much during the past few days. This is a general danger signal to all ships equipped with wireless apparatus within range, and warns them to be on the alert to render help if necessary. The initials CQD may naturally be supposed to stand for Come Quick, Danger. The message I received was as follows. Hear general call and message repeated. Republic 15 miles south of Nantucket light vessel. Requires immediate assistance. Do utmost to reach her. Sias Consett. Among the ships responding to the CQD message were the Luciana, La Lorraine, the Furnesia, the New York, the Gresham, and the Seneca, the latter two being United States government vessels. You can easily imagine that our operator was kept pretty busy receiving these messages and sending them to the bridge, and that on the bridge we were kept busy, not merely responding to them by wireless replies, but changing the course of our ship in response to the directions or instructions which they gave. As a matter of fact, it may literally be said that my ship, the Baltic, was steered some of the time by Captain Sealby on the Republic. For example, read these messages from Captain Sealby. Here Captain Ransom selected from a pile of a hundred or more telegrams, written on the thin paper blanks of the Marconi Company, the following dispatches, apologizing for their somewhat bedraggled appearance, which he explained was due to the fog and rain that enveloped the Baltic's bridge, where they had been received and read. The Outlook Editors You are getting louder. Keep steering east-south-east. Listen for our ship's bell. Sealby Steer southeast now. Sealby But it was not only these direct instructions that helped me, which were received, of course, after we were near enough to the Republic so that she could hear our whistle and the bombs we were firing. Some of Captain Sealby's telegrams helped me by inference. For example, quite early in the day I received this wireless. Have picked up Nantucket by submarine bell bearing north-northeast, sounding 35 fathoms. Sealby. Now, this gave me very important and useful information. I knew that the Nantucket lightship's bell could be heard by the submarine telephone not over 17 miles, 
and that therefore the Republic must be within a radius of seventeen miles from the lightship. Consequently, when I could not hear the submarine myself, I knew that I was outside of the Republic's position. In the second place, I knew the Republic was in thirty-five fathoms of water. So we kept sounding continually, and as soon as we struck forty fathoms we changed our course to strike thirty-five fathoms, for I knew there was no use of our being in forty fathoms when they were in thirty-five, and so it was when we got near enough to the Republic for them to hear our whistle. When I received a message from Captain Sealby saying, We heard your whistle, but it has gone out of range now, we immediately changed our course to get within range again. Here are some of the messages received during the day that indicate the kind of wireless conversation that was continually going on. Luciana says, please listen for his four blasts. Republic says we can hear a bomb to the west of us. Is it you? La Lorraine says he hears Republic's bell and is steering straight towards him. La Lorraine says, tell Captain Ransom we are blowing a whistle, not a horn. Please make as much noise as possible. Have not heard Luciana, but she is still around. I'm in touch with Lorraine. Sealby. La Lorraine and Baltic ask Republic if he hears bell, bomb, or whistle. He replies he hears steamer's whistle and thinks we both must be close to him. Baltic operator. Republic operator says, we are sinking rapidly. We are keeping everything clear and standing by for Republic's signals. Baltic operator. Captain Baltic, I'm cruising round trying to locate you. Captain Luciana. Captain Baltic, there is a bomb bearing northwest from me. Keep firing. Sealby. Siasconset says, here from Republic, says to Baltic to hurry, they are sinking fast. Baltic operator. Tell Captain Ransom steer northeast at once. Sealby. For Nessia, which had turned round to render assistance, now thirty-five miles west Nantucket, will take three hours to get back. Siasconset. Captain Ransom, can we be of any assistance? If not, we'll proceed to New York, as we have hardly enough coal to reach port. You are very close now. Right abeam. Come carefully. You are on your port side. Have just seen your rocket. You are very close to us. Sealby. These messages, taken at random from scores of others, may seem somewhat matter-of-fact to you, but I can assure you they meant a good deal to us on the bridge of the Baltic, and they indicate how we had to feel our way. After twelve hours' search, zigzagging and circling in the fog, changing our course as each new bit of information came by wireless, we at last found the Republic. We came within a hundred feet of the ship before we could see anything, and then we saw only the faint glare of a green light they were burning, like the illumination you burn on the 4th of July. The ship's side lights we could not distinguish, and that was why there was no real use in sending up rockets, although we did so constantly on the chance of their being seen. The passengers had already been taken aboard the Florida, so there was no anxiety about them. The Florida was still well afloat, and there was no danger of her going down, so the first thing for us to do was to transfer the crew from the Republic to our ship. Later we steamed to the Florida and took off the passengers of both ships. As far as I could ascertain, the number taken from the Florida was 1,516 people. There was quite a nasty sea running and a thick fog. We went to leeward. We did not dare to go to windward of the Florida, as we should have been blown on top of her. The process of transfer was simple enough. We started at eleven o'clock on Saturday night, and the crews of the three ships, the Republic, the Florida, and the Baltic, rowed back and forth in the Republic's lifeboats, and finished the next morning about eight o'clock. Both passengers and crews behaved remarkably well, 
but I am sure it seemed to them a perfectly simple and natural thing to do, although of course somewhat uncomfortable. The unusual thing about it was that the Republic's passengers were transferred twice for reasons of safety, within a comparatively few hours, on the open sea, and in small boats. This has never occurred before in my experience. You ask why Captain Sealby felt that he must stick by his ship even at great personal risk. It is true that he and his second officer were the only ones on board when the Republic foundered, and were thrown into the sea and rescued with some difficulty on account of the darkness. They ran this risk, not in the least to indulge in pyrotechnics, for Captain Sealby is not that kind of a man, but for two very good reasons. First, it is a tradition of the sea that a captain must stick to his ship until the last hope is gone, and that then he must be the last one to leave her. In the second place, if he should abandon his ship even with the conviction that she was hopelessly lost, and then some other vessel or seaman should come along and save her, his own judgment could very easily be questioned, and his reputation as a resourceful and trustworthy commander would be irretrievably ruined. As to the work involved, it was hard for everybody concerned, but that is a part of the trade. During the time of the search, I was where I had to be, of course, on the bridge. I went up about six o'clock on Friday morning, and stayed there until we docked at one o'clock on Monday afternoon, about eighty hours food? My food was brought up to me. Sleep? Why, no, I was there on the bridge walking around. I couldn't have slept even had I gone below. However, that is not unusual. We often have two or three days on the bridge without rest in bad weather, and the effect of that is usually that one cannot sleep for some time afterward. For instance, on Monday night, after I got ashore and was free from all responsibility, I could not sleep. Yes, all these modern appliances which aided us in our search for the Republic add greatly to the safety of passengers. These modern devices for safety in navigation correspond to the block signal system in railroad travel. Of course, we have our lookout up in the crow's nest who calls out, all's well, just as the lookout did before modern safeguards were thought of. We have had the submarine bell apparatus on all the White Star ships for about five years. It is a comparatively recent invention. American? Yes, an American invention. From Boston, I believe. I see no reason to think that we have reached the climax of invention for safety devices in navigation. There is always something new. Who would have thought ten years ago of wireless messages to be used in saving life at sea? Nobody dreamed of it, and it is quite possible to conceive that other discoveries may be made of equal benefit to navigation. End of section 108「Section 109 of the United States。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 13. The United States. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 109. The National Red Cross at Work by Constance D. Loop. Early in the afternoon of Tuesday, March 25, 1913, the telephone bell rang in the office of the National Red Cross at the War Department in Washington. "'Miss Boardman,' said a man's voice, "'this is the office of the Associated Press. The Miami River is rising in Ohio, and the town of Dayton is partly under water. Other rivers are rising, and it looks as if there might be serious trouble.' Miss Mabel Boardman, chairman of the National Relief Board of the American National Red Cross, ascertained the meager details, rang off, dictated a telegram to Governor Cox of Ohio, asking if he needed help, and turned her attention back to the really serious situation in tornado-swept Omaha. 
Governor Cox telegraphed back his thanks, but said the trouble was not serious. Then followed three telegrams in quick succession the same afternoon, saying that matters were getting worse, the water was still rising, there were already many deaths, and that the state would be glad to have the assistance of the National Red Cross. The officers were not taken unawares. They never are, for their object in life is to lie in ambush awaiting the unexpected. And the machinery of the Red Cross is a very perfect, well-oiled piece of mechanism that can be set in motion by the pressing of one lever at headquarters. To be sure, the Director General, Mr. Ernest P. Bicknell, had started 24 hours before for Nebraska, it was problematical what he would do when he heard the CQD from Ohio, and he was out of reach of the telegraph. To ensure a director on the scene of action in both places, the ever-vigilant Miss Boardman telegraphed Mr. Lees of Chicago to proceed to Omaha, and Mr. Edmonds of Cincinnati to take charge in Dayton pending Mr. Bicknell's arrival. So much, and a good deal more, was already accomplished before people of the country at large learned through the morning papers of Wednesday the 26th that a fearful calamity had overtaken Ohio. By that time, a rescue party had been detailed and was hurrying towards each threatened district along the rivers that were still rising with terrifying rapidity. These were no armies of well-meant, unskilled volunteers, but trained bands of emergency workers, doctors, and nurses, each under a competent general who had dropped his regular work at the Red Cross call to arms. Whatever you do every day for your living— if you are on the Red Cross emergency roll, if, in other words, you are allowed to help in time of trouble, it means that you are among the elect of your kind. On the afternoon of the 26th, the office of the Red Cross in the War Department is a particularly peaceful-looking spot. A casual glance around would never lead the uninitiated to suspect that the greatest disaster this generation has known is in progress, and that the relief work is being directed from this little room. At her desk sits Miss Boardman with her hat still on, alternately dictating telegrams and conversing on the long-distance telephone all up and down the Atlantic seacoast. A secretary is ticking a typewriter, another is being interviewed by a reporter in a corner, and an army officer is calmly reading in the afternoon paper a highly colored and brilliantly imaginative account of the news from the front. A messenger boy enters with a telegram, and leans negligently against the desk with the vacuous expression that sits eternally on the face of the messenger boy. There are no floods, no wars for him, just an everlasting round of dodging in and out of elevators with dispatches. Miss Boardman tears the telegram open, glances it over hastily, calls up the Associated Press, and gives over the telephone the news that brings forth an extra within an hour in cities all over the country. A message has actually come through from the beleaguered, burning city of Dayton. A cry for help has come at last over the one intact wire that spans the flood. It is not much in the way of news, but the American people want everything there is, and the Red Cross is glad to give it to them. For where, but to the generosity of these same American people, does the Red Cross look for the money and provisions with which to carry on the work of relief? Mr. Edmonds has telegraphed from Dayton that he needs cooked food, clothing, bedding, doctors, and nurses. No tents, asks the reporter, and is informed that the Secretary of War has dispatched those long ago from the nearest posts. From Akron, Miss Gladwin, chairman of the local Red Cross Nursing Association, has proceeded with a staff of 18 nurses to report at Columbus to Major Fauntleroy, who is the Army Medical Officer in charge of the Division Hospital being assembled there. Major Fauntleroy has a staff of eight army surgeons besides the equipment, which, though consisting of tents and fittings which can be packed and carried to the battlefield, is as complete as that of any hospital. Thirty nurses from the nearby towns are already at Dayton, and Cincinnati is to send ten more. Mr. James Jackson of Cleveland has taken charge at Pequa and Sydney. Dr. Edward T. Devine of New York has telephoned that he is ready to report for duty anywhere he is wanted. Ordinarily, the Red Cross makes requisitions on its nearby members. But Dr. Devine grew up near the scene of the present disaster, and besides being at home there, he is particularly valuable because of his experience in San Francisco, at the sinking of the Slocum and the Titanic, and at the Triangle Fire, so Miss Boardman asks him to go to Columbus and report to the governor. 
the Cincinnati and Cleveland Red Cross chapters are instructed to go ahead and raise funds and supplies. Telegrams have been dispatched to the governors of all the states, to the Red Cross state boards, and to local chapters, appealing to all for aid. In other words, the Red Cross is calling out all the reserves, which is a most unusual procedure even in very grave situations. This means an appeal for money and supplies published in every daily paper in the United States. On the morrow, the money will come rolling in, and the little band of workers in the home office will have plenty of bookkeeping and receipt writing, besides the work of holding themselves constantly responsive to the outside world by telephone and telegrams. Letter writing has become a lost art. The typewriters are used only to write out dispatches. At half past four, Miss Boardman rises and pulls down the roller top of her desk. Mr. McGee, will you get out the atlas and look up all the large towns near the flooded district where we haven't chapters, and why are the mayors for aid? She waves a handful of telegrams. Oh, and this telegraphing is going to be a big expense to us. Better ask the companies for free service. There is a tradition that no soulless corporation has ever refused one of these requests from the Red Cross. Here are two checks that came in today from people in the city, she continues. Will you please send them to Mr. Reeside, so that the district committee may have the credit for them on their books? And here, handing a slip of paper to her secretary, is where I can be reached from 8 until 10.30, and at this house from 10.30 to 12, before and after that at home. And Miss Boardman draws on her gloves and pulls down her veil with the unruffled composure of one who has just completed a routine day's work. Tomorrow will bring complications of a different kind, she knows, for besides the bookkeeping and care of the money, there will be many blundering, well-meant offers of help. Out-of-the-way towns which have collected supplies and do not know how to forward them, theatrical companies who will give their services, if she will make the arrangements, etc., and these things must not be allowed to clog the smooth perfection of the machinery, which is working to fill the greatest needs of the stricken communities in the shortest possible time. Now, a word about the machinery itself. In 1905, the Red Cross was reorganized and put on its present basis. The President of the United States is always its president, and the executive officers make their headquarters in the Capitol. Miss Boardman is the chairman of the National Relief Board, and Mr. Bicknell is the national director, which means that he has charge in the field when the disaster is serious enough to require national aid. Small disasters are handled by the local organizations. The governor of each state is the president of the state board, which consists of six or eight well-known business and professional men who have charge of raising funds and supplies locally. This board has nothing whatsoever to do with the relief work, which is in the charge of the institutional members. These institutional members are all of them charity organizations, and the best and most efficient of their kind. Less than 20 in the whole country qualify for membership, but these are geographically widely scattered. An officer, ordinarily the secretary, of the institutional member nearest the scene of the disaster, is the first one to proceed thither. He takes charge of the relief work, but never has the task of raising money. Besides the staff of trained workers in his own society to call upon for aid, he is also chairman of a committee consisting of a member from each of the other active charity and social organizations within the city. In addition to the state boards and the institutional members, there are the local chapters in smaller places. All this sounds much more complicated than it really is, for when a call to arms comes, each steps into his appointed place and does his prearranged task. For instance, when the office in Washington first hears of a disaster— a telegram is sent at once to the governor of the state where it occurs, to find out if the state can handle it, or if national help is wanted. At a request for national aid, the president promptly issues a proclamation and appeal, and this is followed by the appeals of the governors, if deemed necessary. The money collected locally is sent to Washington, and from there to the governor of the afflicted state. Four thousand nurses, living and practicing all over the country, are at the service of the Red Cross. A register of these nurses is kept in every large city throughout the country, so that the chairman in charge has only to send for those nearest at hand. A nurse who is on a case when a summons comes is of course excused, but must hold herself in readiness for a summons as soon as she is off duty, 
if the crisis is not then passed. Perhaps half of the graduate nurses of the country could not qualify for the Red Cross register. Besides requiring a degree from a good school, this stern taskmaster requires two years of active experience, personal integrity, very sound physique, and a devotion which will make the nurses willing to come for just half the regular fees, the Red Cross in this accepting the rate of pay in vogue for the army nurses. Understudies are everywhere provided throughout this marvelous system, so that nothing is thrown out of gear even when the national director is lost. It is miraculously free from red tape. For years now it has in times of peace prepared for war, but it stands armed and vigilant against the elements rather than against a human foe. End of section 109「Section 110 of the United States read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Gettysburg, 50 years after Photograph, page 558 For the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, a mighty reunion of Union and Confederate veterans was planned. Lindley M. Garrison, Secretary of War, said, Thousands and tens of thousands of former foes are here gathered together in brotherly union you who first met upon this field to vie with each other in doing hurt the one to the other now meet here to outvie each other in deeds of kindness and friendship and love history holds no parallel in the battle of eighteen sixty three at the bloody angle formed by a break in the stone wall the men of pickett and pettigrew were jammed together and enfiladed after they had charged across the valley from seminary ridge which faces cemetery ridge there, though smashed to pieces by Hancock's pitiless fire, the heroic rebels broke over the stone wall, and Armistead laid his hand on a Union cannon and fell dead. They call it the high water mark of the rebellion. At the reunion, when it came to be three o'clock, the time when they made that other charge, Pickett's men again crowded their way through the thick underbrush and made their way up the hill. All along the stone wall, eager hands bent down to help them up the wall. In every face that bent above them from the stone wall was an eager welcoming smile, and over them, as they reached it, floated a great flag, the flag of the United States, with forty-eight stars in it. Hancock's men pulled them over the wall, and instantly the formation was gone. The blue and the gray were huddled indiscriminately together in the bloody angle, clapping each other on the back and telling each other how thankful they were that they had lived to see this day. End of section 110 this recording is in the public domain. Section 111 of the United States Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia America for Me by Henry van Dyke Tis fine to see the old world and travel up and down Among the famous palaces and the cities of renown To admire the crumbly castles and the statues of the kings but now I think I've had enough of antiquated things. So it's home again and home again, America for me. My heart is turning home again, and there I long to be. In the land of youth and freedom, beyond the ocean bars, where the air is full of sunlight and the flag is full of stars. Oh, London is a man's town, there's power in the air, and Paris is a woman's town with flowers in her hair. And it's sweet to dream in Venice, and it's great to study Rome. But when it comes to living, there is no place like home. I like the German fir woods in green battalions drilled. I like the gardens of Versailles with flashing fountains filled. But oh, to take your hand, my dear, and ramble for a day in the friendly western woodland where nature has her way. I know that Europe's wonderful, yet something seems to lack. The past is too much with her, and the people looking back. But the glory of the present is to make the future free. We love our land for what she is, and what she is to be. Oh, it's home again, and home again, America for me. I want a ship that's westward bound to plough the rolling sea, to the blessed land of room enough beyond the ocean bars, where the air is full of sunlight and the flag is full of stars. End of section 111. This recording is in the public domain.
End of the World Story A History of the World in Story, Song and Art Volume 13, The United States Edited by Evermarch Tappan.